As we move into this installment in our study of the Word of Reconciliation, I'd like to remind everybody here and those that will be viewing it on television and possibly through CDs that this is designed, each sermon that is, to stand alone, but at the same time, when we're finished with the whole thing, one is designed to lead to the other and the other build on it. So I just wanted to say that at this stage in our study, and I'll have cause to say that again as we go through this study of the Word of Reconciliation. That terminology comes from Paul's own pen in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where in verse 18 he penned, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Then he says in verse 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Now you notice from the beginning, if you've been with us to study, that we've emphasized that the apostles of Jesus Christ are also known as the ambassadors of Christ, and that's made quite evident here. We've emphasized that in government of men, from one government to another, they will have an official ambassador who can state the exact position, and authorized so to do, of a government on any particular thing. It was then Jesus choosing the apostles to be his ambassadors from the court of heaven to earth, and that's how we receive the word of reconciliation. That is, every word of the New Testament. And that's why in Acts 2 verse 42, Following the establishment of the Lord's church, the early church understood that if they were to know the will of their head, their king, their savior, Jesus Christ, they had to follow the words of the apostles or the ambassadors of Christ. And verse 42 then says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now I want to talk a while this morning regarding the matter of the qualifications of these men we know as the apostles of Christ or the ambassadors of Christ. In Romans 3 and verse 9, we find Paul saying, What then? Are we better than they, meaning Jews, better than Gentiles? Then he answers himself saying, No, in no wise. For we have proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Now let's remind ourselves that sin is not just what you don't like or I don't like. That sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3 in verse 4. The idea of transgression there in the original language was to miss the mark. Let's say you're aiming an arrow at a bullseye. And you miss the bullseye, then you've sinned in that sin. So it was the idea of here's the standard and you have broken the standard, you have failed in the standard. We read also from Romans 3, 20 see then, that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's what Paul is emphasizing. All of these then, Jew and Gentile, all of these were alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Ephesians 4 and verse 18. And you'll know they were divided into various languages from the time of the Tower of Babel. And something of the difficulty of the great work that Jesus called the apostles to do is seen on the day of Pentecost when the church was established because you had uh, Jews gathered out of every nation under heaven. They were devout men. They were there to do what the law said they were to do because they loved God and wanted to keep His commandments. And that's what the word devout carries to our minds regarding the description of the spirituality of these people. Uh, but they were from every nation under heaven. That is, the Jews of the dispersion 
were still living according to the law of Moses. But yet they were raised in places to where they had different languages. It's interesting that God in His wisdom chose on the birthday of the Lord's church and the proclamation of the gospel that He had each one of the apostles miraculously speaking to these people in the tongues as they said wherein they were born the wonderful works of God. So the scope of this sermon is set out in this particular question. Did they, the apostles of Christ, the ambassadors of the court of heaven to mankind, did they possess the requisite qualifications? Now you keep that in mind. That is, were they qualified or are they not qualified? And you know, a lot of times today there are all sorts of things that people do and they have to be qualified to do it. So let's keep that in mind. There are people today who claim to be apostles of Christ. There are people today in their religions who claim to be in the same office as the apostles of Christ. Well, if such were the case, then they would have the God-given qualifications if they're in those offices because they still exist. These folks were chosen of Christ and they could prove to the people they were dealing with that God had chosen them for they had the qualifications that proved they were apostles or ambassadors of the court of heaven. Now, the greater part of the human family belonged to what we would call just common, ordinary people. If you could speak Chinese today and you knew their culture, and you could go over there, you'd find out people are pretty much the same there as they are here. If you could do that in Russia or in the Philippines or wherever you might be, if you had their culture and understood it and you spoke their language as well as they do, you'd find out that men are men. We're all moved by like passions and interests. So you find then that the human family belonged to what we might call the common walks of life. It is interesting that those people who basically heard Christ in his earthly ministry were said to be the common people, the ordinary people. They have always tended to be the ones, regardless of the nation or culture, to listen to the words of the gospel of Christ. Now, the wisdom of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is displayed in selecting the apostles, considering who they are for the most part. And you'll see that he took them mainly from the ordinary group of men. There are, of course, variations even among the common people, but that's basically what they were. First, being of the common people, they could more easily approach that class than if they had been otherwise. Second, being unlearned men, that is, no formal education. When they were able to speak to every man in his own tongue wherein he was born, then their inspiration of the Holy Spirit became quite evident as you can read in your own Bibles in Acts chapter 2. Also, we want to emphasize a second major point is that the personal ministry of Jesus lasted roughly three and a half years. We don't know exactly, but roughly so. And for about those three years, except the time they spent in preaching the gospel of the kingdom in the limited commission among the cities of Israel, then these apostles or ambassadors of the court of heaven that Jesus chose were in his personal and immediate company. Therefore, they were witnesses on uh, numerous occasions of the many, many miracles that he did. They saw him give sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf. They saw him cool, if you please, a raging fever and to steady the palsied frame. They saw him cleanse the incurable and loathsome leper and set the captive demoniac free from demon possessions. And he did it all by the power of his word. His will was set forth in his word and these things were done. They saw him by his word calm the troubled and stormy sea and they saw him raise the dead by the power of his will and his word. They heard his wondrous teaching. And they stood amazed. And there were exclamations like, 
No man ever spake like this man. And our hearts burn within us to have been able to have heard the Son of Man teaching us of the wonderful things of God. And you might know that these apostles hung in rapture upon every one of his gracious words. And they were amazed. They heard him speak his many parables illustrating the kingdom of heaven that he had come himself to establish. And then they had even a greater privilege for they in privacy heard him explain the meaning of those parables. Then they too witnessed the shameful and illegal trial and its terrible and crucifixion that brought so much agony upon him. They stood there and witnessed the darkening heavens and the trembling earth and the open graves at his resurrection. They beheld all those things for the mighty maker on the cross of Calvary the mighty maker of all this world was dying and nature let it be known in no uncertain terms. They heard lips speak the final words from Christ and they heard him just before his body went lip when he died. They saw the empty tomb. They looked upon him with their eyes and handled his resurrected body with their own hands to use the words of John, 1 John. And they were with him some 40 days, eating and drinking with him before he ascended up on high to be sat upon his throne and where he now rules. And Peter declared him so to be in Acts chapter 2. It was during this time that he committed to these apostles what we're studying now, the word of reconciliation. Now the purpose of all this, so far as personal knowledge was concerned, was that they, the apostles, the ambassadors of Christ, should be fully qualified for the work that he had entrusted them to do. Mark records for us in Mark 3 and verse 14, speaking of Jesus, and he ordained, that is, he appointed them. He ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. Then there in that first chapter of Acts, Luke records in Acts 1, 21 and 22, as they're selecting one to take Judas Iscariot's place, for he, as Peter declared, by transgression fell. And that such was a part of prophecy concerning one to take his place. Wherefore these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us. Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Leaving that. We make the bold declaration that all too often we find so true. That is that human memory is a treacherous thing. The most important things may be for a time forgotten, passed out of mind. Jesus our Lord during his personal association with the apostles had fully and completely taught them the doctrine and principles of the kingdom of heaven. You can't read through Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and not see that. Uh, but they, like us, were liable to forget them. Now, to help them, to aid them, then he promised, our Lord promised, when he went away, to send them another comforter. Well, you have to have a first comforter to have another comforter. Jesus was that first comforter. And I say this concerning the Greek word parakletos, it's translated comforter, that it is not just comforter. That only translates an aspect of the work of the Spirit with the apostles. The best way to think of the work of the Holy Spirit with the apostles is to think of the work of Jesus Christ with the apostles. And that will help you understand the relationship that the Holy Spirit had with the apostles. But one thing he would be, he would be an infallible guide to them. Now listen to what John had to say. In John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, concerning Jesus, 
and his comments to these apostles. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Notice the emphasis of what the Spirit would do with him. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Well, they could receive the Christ. He's in the flesh, and you see what they did to him. But they cannot receive the Holy Spirit because he's not in flesh and uh, bones, or he doesn't have flesh and bones. He's not in a body. But he's still with them, and he'll say, and He'll be in you. Notice, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. But then we read from John 14, 26, Jesus saying, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And that's what you call infallibility. They could remember when they needed to the exact words of Christ on whatever he taught. But it wasn't by their own power as humans. It would be because God stepped in through the Holy Spirit and made it possible. Now notice what we have also from John 15, 26 along this line. All of it beginning to show us how these men were qualified and their qualifications. Jesus speaking, but when the Comforter, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, again emphasizing the fundamental reason that he was with them, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. John 15, 26. I pause here to point this out. People talk a lot about the Holy Spirit doing thus and so with them today, not knowing this verse was fulfilled in the work the apostles did. Never was said to be what all would be for every member of the church. But it's interesting to note they'll just about attribute anything to the Holy Spirit, and it's always glorifying the Holy Spirit. Have you ever noticed that? It's always saying, do you have the Holy Spirit? It's the Holy Spirit this, the Holy Spirit that. Have you ever noticed what was said right here? The Holy Spirit, according to Jesus, will testify of me. Men who had this power of which we're reading now didn't go around talking about the Holy Spirit. They went around talking about Christ. And one of the telltale things that tells you a person does not have of the Holy Spirit what they had is when they're always talking about the Holy Spirit. Because when they had the Holy Spirit, as the Lord promised it to the apostles to enable them to be what he called them to be, they went on talking about Christ. Now read the book of Acts and see if it's not so. Then we read in John 16, verse 13. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, he shall speak. And he will show you things to come. John 16, 13. Again, he will speak concerning Christ. He will put into your minds infallibly what you need to say when you need to say it. And you'll say it how it needs to be said and so forth. Because it's Christ through the Spirit giving us the New Testament of Christ. That's just exactly how we got our New Testament. Now he also promised that they should be endued with power from on high. That's more of a general statement about the Holy Spirit working with them. Luke 24, 49. And that they should receive power after that the Holy Ghost came upon them. Acts 1, 8. Now these promises were to the twelve. But then they also were for the Apostle Paul. As he said of himself, as the Spirit guided him to say this as a part of the New Testament of the Christ, one who was born out of due time or due season. In other words, he didn't come to be an apostle in the way the others came to be an apostle. But he also received the power because he is an ambassador of Christ and he had to have the credentials that would prove him to be an ambassador of Christ. So he received the power that the others received. He just received it later. 
In 2 Corinthians 11, 5, Paul wrote, He was not a whit behind the chiefest apostles. Thus he had what they had to do what they did. He had an abundance of the revelations, according to his writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. And when people were challenging him, that is challenging his apostleship, trying to discredit him and say, he's not an apostle. Look, he came along as a Johnny come lately. Paul did not hesitate to say, I have the credentials of an apostle. And he said, truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Now, if you have the signs of an apostle, you're an apostle. Everybody didn't have the signs of an apostle. Because they weren't apostles. Anybody that's an apostle of Christ, an ambassador of the court of heaven to the court of men, chosen specifically by the Lord, is going to have what Paul had and can make the same argument that Paul made. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. You know, when you look at Moses back in the Old Testament, chosen of God, the burning bush, to lead the people of Israel out of captivity, Egyptian captivity. Do you realize that he asked the question, what am I going to tell the people as who sent me? It was at that time that he was told he would be able to work miracles that would be the signs of Moses and would single him out as the one God said is chosen to do this particular work. You know, if everybody has the same signs, they're not peculiar to anything. Everybody didn't have these miraculous signs of an apostle any more than every Israelite had all the signs that Moses had. That's why they're signs of an apostle and not signs of just any member of the church. For they had a work to do nobody else did. Well, so completely was he under divine guidance, that is Paul, that here's what he could say, and he did. If any man think himself to be a prophet, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. They knew when they were writing by revelation. They knew when they were writing what the Holy Spirit gave them to write from Jesus Christ. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, Paul wrote, that in latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with the hot iron. Now watch it, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, Paul wrote. Who spake? The Spirit. Expressly means plainly. Paul, where are you getting the information you're writing right now? Now the Spirit speaketh plainly. They knew when they were writing Revelation. You may say, well, what would that be like? I don't know because I don't have what they had. <laughs> and nobody else alive today or since the apostles of Christ live can understand that in the sense of experiencing it. Now were these promises of divine endowment, were they, were they fulfilled? Well on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, there in the city of Jerusalem where Jesus had told them to wait for the promised power, the apostles were gathered together in one place abiding by the will of their Savior, who had already gone to heaven, waiting there, as the Lord told them. And here's what we find. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts 2, 2 through 4. You know, I hear a lot in all my life have heard about Pentecostal meetings. Pentecostal meetings. And they use that term trying to compare what's going on today with what happened then. You ever notice the difference in those meetings? There are quite a few of them, but a few are, are signal. The original Pentecostal meeting, there was a sudden sound. It sounded like a rushing mighty wind, but there's not any wind. And notice it comes from up to down. I never have seen one of these modern Pentecostal meetings didn't start down go up. 
and I have never seen anything like what happened here. That which sounded like a rushing mighty wind. Some of us have been through hurricanes. Some of us maybe experienced worse than others. So how would you like to hear a blowing like that with the wind? But it's just calm as it is here right now. And it's coming up there down here. There's never been a Pentecostal meeting except this one. Men may call anything anything. But if it's going to be called one thing biblically, it must be like it was biblically. Now going further, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues of fire, like as a fire. Not fire, but like as a fire. Cloven tongues, you see. And it sat. It sat upon each of them. Now that was the signal that God has chosen these ambassadors to begin the work Jesus called them to do. They're being endowed with power from on high. And it happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, that which we know as the Holy Spirit baptism. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now if you look, you'll know those tongues aren't some sort of gibberish that nobody understands on earth today. Or some sort of angelic term, term. But they're simply languages. Just read all of Acts 2 and you'll see language and tongue is used interchangeably. And the people that heard these tongues understood them and said, How hear we ever man in our own tongue when we were born? And that defines once for all what is meant by tongues. Sometimes over in explaining the use of tongues, uh, the gift of tongues in the first century church, it came through the laying on the apostles' hands. You hear it said unknown tongue. If you look, you'll see that that unknown's in italics in the King James Version, which means the translator supplied it. They were trying to say, here is a language the people in that area don't normally speak, so it's unknown to them. Well, you know, if you speak English and understand English, it's not unknown to you. But if you speak Russian and not English, and the tongue's in English, it's unknown to the Russian. <coughs> Now, having been in a number of countries where they spoke other languages other than English, there I heard a lot of unknown tongues, but it wasn't unknown to them. But it was certainly unknown to me. And somebody had to translate what they said into English because I understood it. It's just simply a tongue that a people spoke because in those days they substituted the word tongue for language and language for tongue. On the day of Pentecost, the apostles then were speaking these different languages. And they were speaking the wonderful works of God. How do I know that? The people that heard them speak in their own tongue said that's what they were speaking. Seems simple to me. It goes to show you that when people have some far-fetched notions formed by some foolish doctrine, that they go away from the simple, plain teaching of the Bible. When if they just let the Bible speak and study the Bible and the Bible only, then they'd get the simple definition the Holy Spirit gave to the apostles and they'd understand what's going on. That's always been the problem though, hasn't it? The promise then was here literally fulfilled. And though unlearned, that is, unformally schooled Galileans, they were fully brought under divine power that each could speak to men, representing the various languages of the earth as are listed there in his own tongue wherein he was born. Now the fact of their divine endowment was frequently claimed afterwards. Listen to what's said in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 13. Paul writing to the church of Corinth. Now we and we would be the apostles. Now we apostles have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things to spiritual. The American Standard Version 1901 says combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. In Ephesians 3, 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul speaks of the revelation of the mystery, which in other ages was not made known, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So it was with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, that the apostles preached the gospel, and it was the apostle Peter who wrote that in 1 Peter 1.12. So it is that the ambassadors of the court of heaven that Christ chose to do this great work 
were fully qualified and they were engaged in the ministry of reconciliation with all the authority the God of heaven himself could invest in them. Being thus authorized, their work was binding upon man then. It is now. They have had no successors in office. They are still God's ambassadors. And it is he through them still praying us to be reconciled to God in the precious gospel of Jesus Christ, which is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. And that's the reason the gospel must be preached to every creature. And there are no Christians where the gospel has not gone because that means the word of reconciliation has not gone and men are still alienated from God. So in the, in the regeneration, that is in the new order of things, the Christian age, after Jesus was seated upon the throne of his glory, that Peter declared, as the other apostles did in Acts 2, that Jesus was seated on the throne of his glory. It is said of the apostles, the ambassadors of the court of heaven, that they were to sit upon 12 thrones, judging, that is, teaching and guiding and leading the 12 tribes of Israel, Matthew 19, 28. Well, may I say to you, the apostles, being who we have studied them to be, are still on those 12 thrones thrones of authority and will be as long as Jesus is on his throne that's why we today must continue steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and in breaking of bread and in prayers they are the divinely appointed teachers in spiritual matters today through them came the new testament of Jesus Christ and they proved it was from God and not from men. And they infallibly recorded it because the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised them guided them to write infallibly the word of God. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, Paul said to the young preacher Timothy, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. And that's where we are today. And that's what we're doing even at this present time. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul wrote, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Philippians 4 and verse number 9. That's why Paul could say to the Ephesians, when you read what I wrote, you will know what I know regarding salvation. Well, if you're ignorant of the Bible in general, but especially the New Testament, you're not going to know about Christianity. Thus, you can be sure that the devil is going to do his dead level best to keep you away from the knowledge of the Word of God. Going to stop you, even if you say the Bible is the Word of God, from learning how to study it and rightly divide the Word of truth, which we must, if we'll know the will of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And that's a commandment, folks. It's not just say, well, I, I think I'll do it if I get ready. If you want to know what God's will is for your life, get your head in the book, understanding that's where you find the will of God. That's why Jesus would say, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. You say, well, but, but you don't have Jesus recorded where he actually said anything but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Listen, you don't have it there. Matthew said he said this, Mark said he said this, Luke said he said this, and John said he said this. Now, if they were not infallibly guided by the Holy Spirit, you can't be real sure he did say that. But it was Jesus by the Holy Spirit who wrote the rest of the New Testament too. And that's why it's called the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Even though it's referred to also as the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. For it's the Holy Spirit using the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the New Testament of the Christ, that teaches people what they must do to become Christians and how to live the Christian life. The Word of Reconciliation given to us by the ambassadors of the Christ to tell us the way to glory. If you're not a Christian, then that Word of Reconciliation tells you you must believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. John 8, 24, for faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. You must repent of your sins, for so it's commanded all those alienated from God by their sins, Acts 17, 30. And in taking the rest of the steps in the plan of salvation, one must then, because he's now qualified, confess that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, Matthew 10, 
and 32, Romans 10, 10. Now you're qualified to complete your obedience, being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38. If you haven't done that, you're still separated from God. So I ask you, why not receive from the ambassadors of the court of heaven, those men with the credentials from God, to give you the word that will reconcile you to God if you will humbly accept it and render obedience to it. For Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. As a child of God, if you've forgotten these things, you've deviated from them, you're not being obedient, then in those areas where you know you're wrong, you repent of them. That's God's second law of pardon. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness, and you'll be restored to your first love. If you're subject to the blessed invitation of Jesus, we invite you to come to him while we stand and sing.